Welcome to the Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom podcast with Jacob Ayers, providing actionable content to help you along your journey to financial freedom through real estate investing. As the premier asset class, real estate has helped ordinary people just like you amass fortunes. The benefits of passive income from real estate investing will allow you to live a life you want. And now your host, entrepreneur, real estate investor, and apartment deal syndicator, Jacob Ayers. Hi, and welcome to the Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom podcast, episode 176. Hi, I'm your host, Jacob Ayers. Thanks so much for tuning in to this week's episode. As always, I'm so glad you are here with us today. I think you're going to get so much value from today's guest, who is Mark Kenny. Mark is a seasoned real estate investor, entrepreneur, and founder of Think Multifamily. Mark started his career in real estate over 20 years ago and has extensive experience in property valuation, acquisition, and operations. He has a passion for helping others succeed in the multifamily arena. Mark has invested in over 3,500 units and has a top-notch reputation among multifamily investment communities for providing exceptional value to investors and the community while being easy to work with. Today, Mark shares with us how he got started in his real estate investing journey, going from buying duplexes, triplexes, and those smaller multifamilies to now investing in larger apartments. So without further ado, let's jump into this week's episode. All right, today I welcome on the show, Mark Kenny. Mark, hey, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Jacob. I really appreciate it. I'm really excited to have you on. It's been a long time coming. Now, for the audience members that might not know you, Mark, could you tell us a little bit about yourself, kind of your background, your story, and your journey up to this point? Sure. Grew up in Michigan. I didn't have a bunch growing up, so we, we definitely had a place to live and food, but not much more. And so at a pretty young age, I was, I was telling myself, I need to do something different. I had identical twin brothers. So we were always talking and scheming how we're going to make all this money and, and things like that. Although we had no role models or examples to show us that. So we did the normal thing, went to college. But when we were seniors in college, so we were 21, I guess, me at the time, we decided that we always liked real estate. We decided we wanted to buy the rental properties just like a duplex, three, four unit type deals. Made an offer, got accepted, super excited. And then my dad talked me out of it. <laughs> and, uh, I listened to him. Of course, he's 81 now. He's never bought a rental property ever, but I was 20, 21, 22 at the time. So I definitely listened to him and pulled out of it. And then a couple months later, we got another deal and didn't tell my dad about it. We closed on it and then told them after we closed. <laughs> Big rehab deal. And my brother and I worked on that, got that done. But I still did corporate world. I started buying small properties, but I was a CPA for a while. I did IT consulting for a while, started my own IT company, and uh, continued to buy some smaller properties. And then in uh, 2008, I started my own company, uh, IT company, and started, you know, I was working 80, 85 hours a week, sometimes even more, sleeping three hours a night. And uh, my wife, Tamia, was telling me it's a problem, and I kind of ignored that for a number of years. And then it became a big problem where she was like, well, I think maybe I'm going to try to leave. So I'm like, okay, this is getting serious now, so I need to do something different. We decided, since we both loved real Real estate that we're going to start buying larger multifamily. So that's what we we started buying a little bit larger properties, syndicating, raising money from other people. That was uh, you know several years ago, and then uh, we we have about four thousand doors right now, and that's what we've been doing. So we we started buying, we started a sixty four unit, kind of our first deal, a million dollar raise, and just kept kind of going larger from there. I love it. So you here you are in the corporate world for many years, even you've got your own IT consulting business and you're investing in real estate on the side, which is a hard enough journey for a lot of people. I mean, many people find themselves in a similar path, kind of that part-time real estate investor, part-time, well, full-time, you know, career, whatever that might be. And that's a hard line to kind of walk. So how are you finding it? And then what made you turn the corner to say, hey, I'm going to do real estate full-time? 
It could have been, I don't know if I'd say it easier for me because I'd had my own IT company and there were a couple issues with it. One, most people that I had projects with were people that I knew had projects kind of all over the world. So it was a little bit harder for me to just not go to projects, but I did put myself in a position on some projects where I wasn't there as much. So I could cut my time back a little bit slowly at a time to the point where I just stopped doing it completely. But I took a huge cut in pay by doing that. So for me, it was, you know, I kind of needed to do that to hold the family together, you know, trying to transition from full-time job when you have a wife and kids or whatever you have, and then, you know, not a lot of time. It's hard to do it all on your own. We've kind of structured, we have a group restructured where people can kind of contribute different pieces to the deal. Maybe they're putting earnest money down, or maybe they're putting their you know, balance sheet up for the lender, or someone's buying the deal, or raising capital. So coming in and getting really good at something, whatever your something is, you're probably wired some certain way, just naturally, the way God made you, right? And you're, I would say you can get, continue to get good at a lot of different things, but get really, really deep in the one expertise you have, and you'll become very valuable to other people. So we know people in our group that really, you know, one guy, for example, Eric got brought into two deals on the general partner side just because he was good at analyzing deals. So he got into 450 doors because he was good at analyzing deals. I would say money is the easiest way to get involved typically in a deal, <laughs> but there are a lot of people that do it that don't have the money. So not having money is not an excuse either. The you know, smallest deal anybody in our group did this year was 90 units done about $180 million in a year. And it's because people are contributing their strengths and adding value that way. Was there any kind of mindset shift that happened with you when you kind of turned that corner from investing in the smaller multifamilies, those duplexes, triplexes space to, you know, that first larger multifamily deal? There was, and I was never really nervous about it and scared. I first time really raising money and this is no joke. I, I probably asked my dad for money. I only remember two times in my entire life ever asking my dad for money. So I wasn't really accustomed to asking other people for money, but I did have, I had a partner that I hooked up with and he had more experience at the time than I did. And he had more capital at the time than I did. So that gave me the comfort level that, okay, yeah, it's scary and I'm nervous about it. He really didn't raise capital much, frankly. I did the capital raising, but I had the comfort level that he kind of had enough money potentially to close the deal even if we even if we didn't raise the capital. Yeah, well, that's a comfortable feeling, I'm sure. Right. I wouldn't want to put him in that position and we didn't have to, but I, at least he was in that. He could have potentially done it if we needed him to. So for you, it's kind of overcoming that fear was kind of like that first mindset hurdle. It was. And for me, I wasn't really concerned about the the size. To me, at that time, I was I had gone through all the small properties and it was a nightmare trying to manage them and evict people and you know basically self-managing the properties. So going larger was not an issue in my mind at all. I had that in my head. My obstacle really was raising the capital. That was my big concern. Yeah. And what kind of position did you put yourself in to make that easier on yourself? What kind of like groundwork did you lay to be able to go out and raise that first capital raise of a 1 million, I think you mentioned? Right. So I was letting people kind of know what I was doing. So when someone waits until they have a deal, like I know people that are in real estate just getting involved and they wait to tell people until they get your very first deal. And, and I know a guy, literally his mom didn't even know he was in real estate until he got his first deal. It's just it's reality, you know, but if you need to basically prep people, whatever, however you want to do it through email, newsletter, social media. Hey, I toured a property today, you know, whatever, 110 unit deal in Atlanta. So people kind of see you might not ever get that deal. You might not even pursue the deal, but starting to put these little trickling, if you want to say, of different things you're up to or I analyzed, you know, three deals today and one looks good. That way, when you're trying to ask people or trying to present the opportunity to people, it's not the first time they're hearing about like, I didn't even know you were in real estate, Jacob. What's going on? They kind of see you've been in it. And then it was when you actually get a deal, because it might take you a while. They're like, man, Jacob's been looking for six months. He's done all this analysis and different deals. He finally got one. It must be a good deal because it took him six months to find it. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, like kind of laying that groundwork and, you know, putting those feelers out and just kind of almost building that social reputation that this is what you're doing, you know, this is what you're involved in, I think is probably really vital for that first time deal maker. So it is and and going, you know, people are like, well, I don't want to go to events. Well, you know what, 
I've been to a ton of events this year. We sponsor a ton of events. And in some cases, I'd rather stay home on the weekend with my kids. Reality is, you know, so you have to balance it. But if you're not going to be out there going to events, going to meetups, things like that, you're going to have a lot harder time raising capital. And maybe your thing isn't raising capital. Maybe your thing is analyzing deals or putting money up, whatever it might be. And that's okay. But even try to, to meet other people that you can associate with and say it's a syndicator and you want to come in and put money into the deal. How do you find those guys? You have to be in there, in the market, looking at meetups, events, on bigger pockets, wherever you're going to try to find people. And contributing back is the easiest way for people to be attracted to you is to give them something of value for free. I mean, eventually you can't work for free forever, but giving some sort of value back to somebody is going to be the best way for people to be attracted to you. Yeah, sure. Well, Mark, I'm sure you've heard every limiting belief under the sun out there. And one I get a lot is, well, I don't know any real estate investors that would be interested in investing with me, right? And right. more often than not, the people investing in real estate deals aren't full-time real estate investors. They're engineers, doctors, right. attorneys, whoever it might be. So is that something you see a lot? I do. I mean, like you said, a lot of limiting beliefs, but hey, I just don't, I don't have a list. I don't have, we'll start <laughs> going to places where, and it's okay to go to even events that are single family, even though you're doing multifamily, I would say eventually you might want to just focus your time on the multifamily stuff because there's enough out there if you can go to events and things like that. But you need to get out there meeting people and they need to see you more than once typically. So if someone sees you once, never hears from you, then when they do hear from you, because you have an opportunity, they might not even remember who you are. So go to events, be strategic, meaning don't just like, you know, we had an example, this guy was at the door handing out business cards to every single person that was walking by. It's just it's not strategic at all, you know? Yeah, you want to meet as many people as you can, but you also want to build those relationships. And a lot of people don't want to go out and just talk to people. Reality is most everyone at the event is there for the same reason, some form or fashion. So just going up and talking to them, introducing yourself. And then the biggest one is really following up with them after the fact. However you do that, phone, email, letting them know what you're up to. What can I do to help you in your business? But yeah, I mean, getting out there and meeting people in person is the best way, frankly, to do it. But it can take time to build a list. It won't happen overnight. Yeah, sure. So first and foremost for you, it's building those connections, but not just so much, you know, checking that box of, hey, I went to this networking event and handed out 300 business cards. It's like right. building personal relationships. You can't be the guy at the door just slinging out business right. cards and not following up and expecting that to be, you know, you're checking the box for networking. Right. And it's connection points where people think it's always business. And I, I kind of had the same mindset when I was doing, you know, accounting and IT. I was all business. I didn't have any just business. Well, with real estate, it's completely the opposite. It's all relationships. And the more connection points somebody has with you, someone talks to me and they're like, well, they're in the motorcycles. I'm like, well, oh, my son, Tyler, he, he's in a dirt biking, does jumps and or someone's into dance. My daughter's in dancing and it doesn't have to be even you. It's someone you might know and making a connection point. You know, you mentioned, uh, you know, we talked earlier before this, we started the podcast, I went to Michigan State. I had people literally that have reached out to me just because I went to Michigan State. There you go. <laughs> it's, it's bizarre to me or someone reaches out to me because you were, I was in IT or I was an accountant or whatever it might be. So letting people know what you've done, what you're doing now, and then and listening to them, understanding kind of what is important to them doesn't all have, all have to be business. Building those personal relationships in reality will be more important than building the business relationships. So if you build the personal first, it's much easier to build the business relationship. Yeah, sure. Well, let's kind of switch gears a little bit and talk about maybe to this audience member, this type of audience member that is maybe a younger professional professional, maybe someone just getting started investing in real estate, maybe somebody that has a bit of real estate under their belt, but is looking to turn that corner into doing larger multifamily deals. What is like kind of your initial piece of advice to somebody like that? I would say find a partner, whoever it is, whether it's a coach, mentor, you're going to pay for a coach, mentor, or just find a partner that's willing to partner with you that's done it before. Thinking that you can go out and buy whatever, 100 units on your own. Is it possible? Yeah, it's, it's possible. First of all, you're not you're going to basically get no credibility with a broker. So you need somebody else's relationship that you can leverage. You can say, if my partner, you know, Jacob and I own 4,000 doors. Mm -hmm. 
and we're looking in the area. We bought 15 deals this year. We're looking to buy another five, where it might be. Having a story, but having somebody else's story if you don't have one. If you go out there on your own, I talk to people, literally, and I'll talk to them 12 months later in the exact same position they were before because they think they can do it all on their own. And reality is most people can't. It's not because they're not smart or maybe they might even have money. It's because they have no credibility with a broker or a seller. I would never sell a property that I have to somebody that is a first time buyer, unless they're going to overpay by a fair bit and they have cash. Yeah, so sure. What, what, I, don't, I don't, yeah. And it goes back to what we were saying at the beginning of the show. You've got something, maybe just one thing that you're very good at and a lot of stuff that you maybe are not great at. So bringing that one thing to the table with that partner can sometimes provide value. Like you mentioned to that case scenario, the, the young guy who's very good at analyzing deals, that was his angle in or that was what he was bringing to the table. That's right. Yeah. And it can be anything. People that have capital don't realize how valuable they are because a lot of syndicators aren't very liquid. If I have money out as earnest money on deals, the lender will say, well, that's not liquid anymore. So I can't even count money I have out as earnest money as liquidity. So somebody else that has capital that can come in and say, hey, I'm going to put earnest money down for somebody or I can sign the loan for liquidity. That's the easiest way to get involved in a deal and potentially get part of the general partnership and start building your own track record. Yeah, if you don't sure. have that, a lot of people like you talk about young people might not have that. They need to get really good at something else. And yeah. uh, in, in telling, you know, this is my sound or whatever, but telling someone that you you have time isn't good enough. Well, your time's got to be worth something, right? It's like... <laughs> right. If it's, I have time to do whatever you need, Mark. Well, if you're not good at anything yet and it's okay, you need to get good at something before yeah. you become valuable to people. And if you say, well, I want someone to teach you, that's fine. Have someone to teach you, a coach, mentor, or just someone that you find in the marketplace that's willing to teach you, but get really good at. Yeah, sure. Now, what's your take, Mark, on somebody maybe learning the process by being a passive investor, maybe bringing a little bit of capital to a deal and just being involved in it from that end? I think that's a really good way for people to kind of dip their feet in this world of multifamily. It is. The advantage to it is you you will learn some, and I'll come back to that point in a second. And the second point is that it looks good when you have, you do like a real, real estate owned schedule for a lender and you put that you own whatever, 200 unit property, you're an investor in that. That's attractive to lenders. Now, how much are you going to learn by doing that? I have a difference of opinion than a lot of people. A lot of people are looking for money will tell a passive investor, you're going to learn so much by becoming a passive investor in my deal. Well, reality is you're going to learn 2% of what you're going to need to do your own deal. There's just so many more components to doing your own deal. But it does give you the credibility that you've invested before. You will learn about the legal documents, PPM, subscription agreement. You'll learn all about that, which is great. You'll learn about monthly reports. So you learn an okay amount. But for people that say, come into my deal, you're going to learn so much. You'll learn some, but don't think that that's going to get you prepared to do your own deal because it won't. Yeah, sure. Yeah, interesting point. I guess, you know, you are going to see like the high level deal, how kind of the, the deal is structured, but you're not going to be in the weeds, you know, in the day to day operations, really learning the intricacies of this deal. So yeah, that's right. I think if you have an opportunity to sign on a, a loan as well as a KP key principle, where it's not I'd recommend non recourse only. But if you do, that's another really good way. Because reality is there's a whole slew of other things you have to do to become a KP from a lending standpoint, all the forms you fill out and, and things like that. So that's an added layer of you can have by becoming a KP. Yeah. And maybe before we get too far ahead of ourselves with all this terminology, will you kind of break down some of the different, you know, you've mentioned KPs, we've talked about passive investors versus general partners. Can you just kind of break right. down some of those terms for the audience members that might not be as familiar with them? Yeah, you have. So you have the person that's putting the deal together, they could be called a sponsor, general partner, manager, they're all the same terms. It really depends how you set it up, whether it's an LLC, things like that. LLC, they're a manager. And then you have a lot of people that will say they're an LP or limited partner or a passive investor. Within an LLC, they're really just called a, a member. Mm -hmm. So it's someone that's basically investing in somebody else's deal. So the limited partner, passive investor invests, it will invest in somebody else's deal. So if I have a deal and you, Jacob, put $100,000 in the deal, you're the passive investor in that deal and I, or, you know, LP, and I'm the GP or the manager in that deal. So that's just from a terminology standpoint. Generally speaking, the um, limited partner has no liability from a lender standpoint. 
If you're just a limited partner, you generally have a lot less say in what happens, who the manager company is, when do you refi, when do you sell the property, you might have very limited control over any of that. So you have to be okay with that. Key principle is someone that signs on the loan. It could be someone that signs on the loan and is not even in the deal. Potentially, the two aren't necessarily related, although they typically are. So the lender is going to say, if I have a deal, it's a $5 million loan. The lender is going to say, okay, Mark, your net worth needs to be $5 million or more. And your liquidity is a general statement needs to be 10% or $500,000 or more. If I say, oh my goodness, I don't have that much, then I can bring other people in to be KPs with me, key principals with me on the loan. And then collectively put all our are pooled together, our net worth, liquidity, and that's how we get over that hurdle. Now, the loan, if it's recourse, it means like a lot of single family. So four units and below typically be recourse, which means you have personal liability if something happens on the property. They can come after you personally. With multifamily, you know, we have whatever, a couple hundred million dollars, whatever it is in loans, and it's non-recourse. So non-recourse means we don't have personal liability, but if we do something wrong, called bad boy car routes, then the lender can come after us. So if you and I are in a deal together, I sign as a KP in your deal and I do something wrong, then that can impact you as well on that. So you have to be careful. Don't just sign on loans for the sake of signing on loans. You have to understand who you're getting business with. Those Some of the terminology, I guess. Is that good? Yeah, no, that definitely helps. And I think maybe for those audience members that weren't necessarily sure the difference in LPs versus GPs and things, it's good to right. just break those down because the world of real estate investing is full of jargon. And anytime you start getting involved in any kind of different niche, there seems to be a whole new phrase and terminology for different things. So yeah, there I is. I think we have like 50 definitions on our website too, if you go out there on a glossary because, and it's just, there's way more than 50, but it definitely gives you kind of a definition for a lot of the things I'm covering here as well. Yeah. And just breaking down those definitions, you start to kind of see how many moving parts there are in a deal like this and why it takes a collective team and why it's hard to do that deal on your own. So I think a lot of people out there start out with the mindset that they'd rather have 100% of their own deal rather than share it with somebody else. And right. I think for a lot of people that something eventually clicks and thinks, okay, well, I'd rather be part of Mark's deal and only have, you know, 5% of it than 0% of my nothing yeah, deals. 100% is zero, zero still. And, and that's <laughs> usually what happens. People will think, I mean, reality is you just need to get the track record you need to get your first deal and your second deal will become easier and easier and easier. We'll do we're close to 20 deals this year as a group. And well, I couldn't do 20 deals on my own either. Probably no one could really do 20 deals on their own. <laughs> it's a lot. So we bring people in to help too. And getting a piece of, uh, you know, a bigger pie is much better. Reality is you're surrounding yourself, hopefully with people that have been through it before and have been through some mistakes and can help leverage, you know, those mistakes so you don't have to make them. Yeah, sure. So what are some key team members you think one first getting started should try to go out and look for? Yeah, I mean, depending what relationship you have, you need brokers. So selling brokers, people listing properties and, and things like that. You need a mortgage broker. You don't need a mortgage broker. You can go right to the lender. But if you're starting now, I would suggest you use a mortgage broker who will basically, they're like an insurance broker, essentially. They'll actually look out for, go pursue different opportunities through a lender to say, okay, Jacob, here are the five different options. Here's what I think you should do and why. So they're actually more in tune with all the different lenders. So that's a mortgage broker. You have your insurance broker, CPA. Okay. Not that you're biased, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I don't I don't like to do any of it anymore, so we don't do it either. But you need an attorney, SEC attorney, if you're going to raise capital, and then a transaction attorney, someone's going to do the deal. And it can be the same. We use the same one for both, which I really like. You need a title company. You're going to need a property management company. I mean, list, you're going to tax, you know, property tax, a guy that can tell you what the taxes are going to go to when you, before you buy the property, the list goes on and on, frankly. So there are a lot, those are the kind of the key ones really. And for us, we're already established, right? So if someone comes to us, we can say, well, here's who you talk to for attorney, CPA, property management company, mortgage broker, the team's already established. It could take you a couple of years to try to build that team up yourself and still have someone on your team that you don't think should be on it. We've kind of burned through some people, frankly. So now on our team, we only use people that we know, like, and trust.
trust. That's all we only recommend people that are, you know, we would do business with. Yeah, sure. And then once again, just going back to what we were talking about earlier, it's such a relationship based business that you have to have relationships, true relationships with a lot of these key team members, right? Like you can't just go out and send 100 emails to the brokers in your area and expect that they're going to start sending you deals. So right. The other thing is that some of those team members can be used across states, you know, the whole US, right? So CPA, mortgage broker, attorney, which is great. But other ones like property management company or selling brokers are kind of more regional. Mm -hmm. So you do have to kind of spend the time there. And the people in our group, they can pick up the phone and say, hey, I'm working with Mark. And with brokers that we give them contact information for, it's instant credibility. They don't have to go try to build that credibility up themselves, which is hard to do. Yeah, sure. It kind of goes back to what we're, I like to coin what you were talking about earlier is the power of we, right? Say you, you, Mark and I are going to partner on a deal and I've got no experience and no capital and you have 4,000 units. Now I can say, well, Mark and I own 4,000 units in Dallas and Atlanta. And you know, it's all of a sudden the power of we. So same thing when you're approaching, whether this be your mortgage broker or listing broker, whatever that might be. Now you've got a little credibility. And if you get in a system like you've got, now you've got the power of this team. So yeah, really powerful stuff there. You know, my wife and I, Camille, did a video, my partner and I, that video kind of similar to saying the we. Yeah. yeah. And just the the difference. And people use that and they can, it needs to be true. We know people that sometimes say they partner with different people and they're really not. So don't be off telling people you're partnering with somebody unless you really have a permission to, to do that. Sure. But yeah, it'll, it'll make all the difference in the world on deals. Yeah. Awesome. Mark, it's uh, really interesting to see how somebody like you has turned it from a professional career, you know, buying duplexes and triplexes and starting out in that small multifamily space to now controlling over 4,000 units. So what kind of overarching systems would you say allowed you to do that? Just both mindset and actual logistics of actually doing deals. How does one go from, you know, a position where you once were to where you are now? Yeah, I think um, you have to be willing to be scared. I've been nervous, scared, whatever you want to call it, freaking out on. I'm very calm about things. I'm always like, well, we'll always get it done. But you have to push yourself outside the comfort level. The easiest way to do that, in my opinion, really, someone says, well, I don't know if I can raise money at all. They think they can, but they don't know. They've never done it. As an example, I say, well, team up with other people that can raise money and have already done it before as your cushion. So if you come in and raise zero, yeah, it kind of stinks, but at least you're covered. You can still close a deal. If you come in and hit it out of the park, great. Now you know you can raise capital. So definitely a mindset uh, shift to be okay being uncomfortable and scared. But I would say from a process standpoint, it's probably a little less of a process and more of a a team. So having a team in place that can help you every step of the way, because it's certain that you're going to hit some sort of issue every deal you do. You don't know what it's going to be necessarily when it's going to happen, but something will come up unexpected and you need to have somebody that's been through it before that can help. I tell people we can identify problems a lot faster, fix them a lot faster and make less less issues, less mistakes than, than before, right? Because we've been through certain things. And that results in even things like your contract that you create. We revise our contract over the years because things maybe got burned on before. So you get smarter about what to include in you know a contract and it protects you. And there's certain verbiage we have in there. Literally, I bet you over the last couple of years probably has resulted in you know half a million dollars of savings over projects, literally by having a few lines in our contract. Yeah, sure. Learning from other people's mistakes, right? Right. In this case, sometimes our own. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I think a lot of people when they're first getting started tend to think that capital is the biggest limiting factor. And it's easy to see why. But once you get into deals like this, you actually come to find out that good deals and good teams are actually more of the limiting factors in your success. So do you think that's true? It is without without a doubt. I mean, the you're never going to get in a position where you're probably even doing a deal if you don't have a team in place, right? But the capital... I just say that if you've never raised capital before, it still can be an issue because you don't have the credibility yet. If you have the team in place, if you have your own track record, which could be zero. So leverage, if you have a profession that is kind of respected in the industry, whatever it may be, a doctor or you're in the military, whatever, you leverage that. And it's okay to say, I don't have experience with this yet. That's why I'm teamed up with Jacob. And Jacob is, let me tell you about Jacob. So you have yourself, you have your team, and then you have the actual deal itself. End of the day, they really, someone needs to know, like, and trust you. And trust is, you know, I mean, 
end of the day, I'm a little cynical about it because people I've trusted before sometimes I haven't always done what they wanted to. They say they're going to do, but um, you have to use the the information you have at the time to, to make decisions. Yeah, sure. And talking about trust, Mark, you're one of the more trusted people in the industry. You've actually got a group called Think Multifamily. You're based out of Dallas. We didn't mention that at the beginning of the show, but tell us a little bit about this group that you've kind of alluded to throughout the episode and when what you guys do there. It's a group we started in it's for educational purposes. And, and frankly, we started it because we were kind of getting sick of a lot of people that were educating in the industry and not to knock them at all, but not really given full picture or not sharing mistakes and everything's always rosy and not telling them about different ways you can raise capital and just basically limiting what they're teaching people. I don't believe in that approach. So we started it with a whole goal of helping people change their life just like we did, but sharing every single thing that we know, sharing all the contacts we have have and having a community or more of a family in a way where people come in together and if you need help on a deal, Jacob, you're doing a deal and you need help raising capital, somebody will help raise capital with you. If you need help with earnest money, somebody helps with earnest money, the balance sheet for the lender, whatever it might be. So you can come in with your strength and other people have strengths that are that are probably better than yours in other areas and you're better than them in other areas. So everyone's using their strength to the max. So if all you did, I mean, you're not saying you have to do that. If all you did is analyze deals every every day, you probably get pretty darn good at it. Right? I mean, <laughs> you, you would, would, would. You're going to be better than somebody that analyzes a deal once a month. So leveraging those strengths. The whole the whole goal was really to allow people, mostly working professionals, to be able to either have more time for family or quit their job. Hopefully, I did it. I did it less than three years, and I didn't have someone helping me that much, frankly. So we're like, people can do it faster if they have the right people and have more time for the family, give back. We like, you know, we support orphanages. We support uh, sex traffic industry. My wife, Tamil, has been on some mission trips to Nigeria and Guatemala. So I want to be able to give back to the world, essentially. But end of the day, it's really helping people that want to be helped change their life. We call it family syndication. So it's kind of a family working together to help each other in those areas where someone needs help and everyone everyone has each other's back. And it's really a culture and community. And we have we have fun together. We do closed group training just for our group. We have other training events we have open to the public as well. We do a cruise. So in June we'll be going on a cruise for a second time. And it'll be uh people bringing their kids, we bring our kids. And it's just to hang out and have fun, a little education. The rest of the time is pool or islands and, and things like that and building those relationships that aren't just business relationships, but they're also lifelong personal relationships. Yeah. So you've essentially created an ecosystem of like-minded people and people that are able to get together and network and bring their strengths and lean on other people for these different parts of the team that we've talked about. And what I really like that you guys are doing is you're doing it for a reason. Like you've got a vision that real estate's not your driving factor. It's just a means to an end to be able to do these things. Like you mentioned, giving back to the world and donating to these causes and spending time with the people you want and just having kind of like that lifestyle freedom. So yeah, I think that's what it's all about. It is. And having that group together, like you said, an ecosystem where you can do that and people can say whatever, but we're always, we're always humble. I always tell my kids either be humble or you're going to become humble. So I don't right. care how, how big someone thinks they are, or how great they think they are. One second of a, a day could change your life forever. Her, hearing something, some sort of news or some sort of event in your life. So don't think that you're all that just because you think you're making decent money. There's always somebody out there bigger, better. So just be content with what you have. Give back to other people. Help them become successful. I'm super excited. There's a guy in our group doing a $39 million deal and I'm partnering with him on it. But it's a bigger deal than I've ever done on my own. That's right? awesome. So yeah. I'm happy for him. I'm super excited for him. Not one time ever. I'm like, I'm kind of jealous. He's doing, you know, he got a bigger deal. I think it's great. I know another guy that was a kind of a, a mentor and someone got a bigger deal than him. So he was all frustrated and had to go try to find a bigger deal. I'm like, that's just <laughs> the wrong approach. You should be happy yeah. for people in your group. It's like your son. My son's like, you think I'll be bigger than you? I'm like, I hope you are. I do. Yeah, I hope you're taller. Of course. I, hope you're, I do, you know, and that's the way our group is. I hope people can go bigger, faster than us and do way greater things than we've ever could do on our own. Yeah, awesome. Well, it's, it's awesome to see what you've built there, Mark. And I think it's really, really cool and interesting stuff. And like I said, it's just good to see that you guys are doing this real estate with like a means to an end and having like a long term vision. I think that's really important. So it's been fun kind of getting to know you talking with you yeah. sharing your journey. And uh, like I said, it's been a long time coming. But uh, wrapping up every episode, we end with a lightning round of questions. We ask every one of our guests, I'm sure it's nothing you can't handle, but are you ready for it? 
I'm good to go. All right, cool. Well, Mark, what was your biggest hurdle getting started investing in real estate way back when? And what did you do to overcome that? Uh, my biggest hurdle was really um, when it was going bigger was the fear of raising capital. And for me, it was putting myself out there and going to events and being, um, I guess, aware that I have to show up more than once for people to be able to invest with me. So sacrificing time with family and going out there and going to events and things like that, meeting people. Yeah, sure. Well, do you have a personal habit that contributes to your success? I'd say I always stay humble. I mean, it's not really a habit necessarily, but it is, I guess, if you tell yourself every day that you're, you know, you're just a human and, and things like that. And then from a personal standpoint, I, I try to exercise like six days a week. It just gives me a little bit of release from a mental standpoint. Awesome. Do you have an online resource that you find valuable in your day to day? Just Google, frankly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it really is. You know, I don't have one resource I go to to try to find stuff I don't. Yeah, sure. Well, what book would you recommend to the listeners and why? I know Kenny McElroy uh, has a good book, ABCs of Multifamily Investing. It's a kind of a written in a way that someone newer can can understand it easily. Mm -hmm. So it's a good it's a good book. Yeah, sure. I actually recommend that book quite a bit. That's the ABCs of Real Estate Investing by Ken McElroy, part of the Rich Dad Advisor series. So great book. If you haven't listened to that or read it, be sure to do so. We'll link that book in the show notes. Last question in the lightning round, Mark, if you're to give advice to your 20 year old self to get started investing in real estate, what would that be today? I'd say you don't have to start out small and then find somebody that's already doing and then it's already at where you want to be. So find someone that's doing and, and they're already in a position where you want to be. Yeah, love it. Well, Mark, hey, it's been a lot of fun talking with you on the show. I'm sure many people out there want to know where they can learn more about you, connect with you, maybe even meet you. So where's the best place for people to do that? So my email is mark, M-A-R-K, at thinkmultifamily.com. The website's thinkmultifamily.com. We have some meetups in Dallas and across some other states as well. And then we have events we do multiple times a year. Um, they're all educational in nature, typically in Dallas, but we were in Atlanta as well and some other areas uh, just uh, sharing and giving back. Yeah, awesome. Great. Well, that's thinkmultifamily.com. If you want to connect with Mark personally, he's been so gracious enough to provide you with this personal email, which is mark at thinkmultifamily.com. Mark, hey, it's been a lot of fun having you on the show today. Look forward to having you back on in the future. Thanks so much for coming on. Thanks, Jacob. I really appreciate it. Yeah, you bet. Well, have a good day, Mark. You too. Bye. All right, that wraps up this week's episode with our guest, Mark Kenny. Mark provided a ton of great information, specifically around the mindset and just what it takes to become an apartment investor. If multifamily investing is something you've been interested in, I highly recommend you check out Mark and his program there called Think Multifamily based out of Dallas, Texas. It's an awesome group. I'm hoping to make it up the road here in the near future to meet up and learn from his group as well. So with that, Hey, I have a quick favor to ask of you. If you're liking these episodes and this show, please go over and leave a rating and review on whichever platform you're listening on. As always, I'd love to hear from you, connect with you. You can contact me directly at www.jacobayers.com forward slash contact or on social media. Till next week, engineer the lifestyle you want. You've been listening to the Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom podcast, providing you actionable content to build your real estate empire. Nothing on this show should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for personal advice. The opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have a potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of the Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom, LLC, exclusively.